Hello! So today we are going to do a flight with the Fly-by-Wire A320 in Microsoft Flight Simulator. And if we have a quick look at the map, we're going to fly down from Brisbane on the east coast of Australia down to Sydney. So it's not a very long flight, but it gives us some good talking points along the way, because the real reason for doing this is to reacquaint myself with the Airbus and to look at some of the lesser known features of the Fly-by-Wire Airbus along the way in the, some of the developments that have been added to the, um, the MCDU over time, or the Flight Management Computer. So we can, we can look at some details around fixes and holds, and doing custom waypoints as well along the way. Okay, so first things first, we're going to go and program the same route into both... Let me just clean the map up here. We're going to do the same route between Brisbane and Sydney in Little Nav Map and in Navigraph to show you how to do that. So we're going to cover off quite a lot in this video, I guess. So rather than just right-clicking on the airports to set up where you're flying from and to, another way you can do it is bring up the search box in Little Nav Map. And we could say YBBN, which is the ICAO code for um, Brisbane. We can right-click on it on the search result and we can set that as the departure point. So it lights up yellow on the map. And then we can go YSSY on our search, and that pulls up Sydney. So we can right click on that and set that as our destination. And that puts the rubber banded route in. So it's just a direct route between the two airports. So then we can come over to the list over here. So rather than trying to squirrel in on the map to find the airport, we can right click over here and we can show departure procedures from Brisbane. So we want to do. Well, I've just already looked at the wind, okay, so we want to take off runway 01 right and we're going to do the SANEG 1 standard instrument departure. So if you do go and double click on the airport and then we can zoom out a little bit, you can actually see what that departure looks like. So it gets superimposed, you can see the different departures. We're going to do SANEG 1 and we're going to right click and insert that into our plan. So you get the orange part there is the standard instrument departure. So it's almost an immediate, you know, right turn immediately after takeoff. Okay, so if we scroll, come down to Sydney. So all we need to do is right click on Sydney, then show the arrival procedures for Kingford Smith. We're going to come in ILS on runway 07, which is right here, and insert it. And we're going to do the star for 07, Bora 3A, there it is and we're going to insert that into our flight plan. So we've now got the standard instrument departure and the standard terminal arrival route. And you'll notice on the end of it, there's a gap between the end of it and um, the approach into the, the runway. So between the arrival and the approach, this would be vectors in the real world. So the ATC would be telling you where to go. Obviously, we'll just do use own navigation. But we'll have a play with fixes on the aircraft to show how we can improve that experience. Um, so in between these two, we're going to want to fly airways. And this is where we hit a real problem with Little NavMap, in that it can't do airways that we select. We can show them, yeah? So we can see that there's an airway here, H91, that we might take all the way down to Igdam. Yeah, H91 carries on all the way to Igdam and then H652 to Bori. So if we think in terms of the text description of what we've got here, we've actually got Brisbane, 01 right, then the Sanig 1, Sid, as far as Sanig, then H91, the airway, to Igdam, then the H652 to Bori, then the Bor 3A star, and then runway 07. So if we copy that, come into Little Nav Map, and say, go to the flight plan route description on the flight plan menu, and it's just warning us we're going to lose potentially what we've done, and we paste this in, so we've got our same description there and we'll say create flight plan and close and it's put all of the airway waypoints in for us yeah so you can see it's marked in here on the flight plan with 
if you not sh if you are trying this yourself and you're not seeing the appropriate columns click on the little cog icon and you can choose what columns you're really wanting to see the procedure the airway or procedure and any restrictions okay so then that will name the airway that you're on along the way okay so that text description of the flight plan is really important because Navigraph has the same problem you can't actually choose airways within the the graphical interface okay so I mean normally airways would be chosen for you you pick up your plan from somewhere like Simbrief and it's done for you so I'm just showing you how you can do it yourself so let's have a little look at this have we still got everything on here I think don't think we have looked because the text description it's ignored the ILS part of this so we're going to go back into here and we're going to say we're going to do the ILS 07 approach so it's got the star it just hasn't got the final approach so it had the arrival not the approach it has got the departure here which is good OK, so how do we do this in Navigraph? Let's just jump over to Navigraph and do exactly the same thing. So we do a new flight and we select our origin. So YBBN is Brisbane, add that to the route. And again, we don't actually have to do any of this. So this is the graphical interface. I'll just illustrate this. YSSY, add this to our route. So there's our basic route, exactly the same as we saw in Little Nav Map. Obviously, we're just showing the high IFR map if we wanted it to look much more like a uh, little nav map we just show the VFR map but if we show the high IFR map that's got that H91 um, route across here if we zoom in far enough we'll see the labels on it yeah so we can't choose that airway there with the mouse so what do we do so rather than go picking away at choosing all the departures and everything what we'll do is go and click on the pencil icon next to the routing at the top of the map and rather than put any of that in we'll paste in that text description of the route so Brisbane 01 right Saneg 1 Saneg H91 and so on and so forth press enter and Navigraph reads it and fills all this, this in for us the only thing it hasn't got in common with um, little nav map is it hasn't got the final approach so we're going to go and choose ILS runway 7 and add that to our route and notice it does the same thing so after we get past ovals on the way in you would have um, vectoring in the real world and we can actually see that on the plate so obviously this is Navigraph so we've got access to the plates so here's the Bori 3A approach expect radar vectors to final once we get to ovals it's interesting isn't it and also something that's not so obvious on here if we go and look at Romy 07 I don't know if it says cat 1 anywhere on the plate here I'm not sure that it does but there's a telltale here that it's got a decision altitude marked in even though it doesn't really say that it's only a cat 1 ILS Um, I'm just looking for any symbology that would indicate it's cat 1 but anyway so we're going to have to fill in the decision altitude which you only have to do if you're on an on a cat 1 ILS interestingly if you look at this in little nav map and we go and look at Kingsford Smith for example and you can see here ILS cat 1 it tells you so where that information comes from it's obviously in the simulator because that's where little nav map gets everything from but it's not on the plate which is quite strange unless I'm just blind and missing it anyway let's go and actually get the airplane up and running then shall we so I'm going to use the checklist that I've commonly used in the past so I'm just pulling that up on another screen so we'll jump inside the airplane and we'll get the Airbus up and running and then we'll have a, a look at that routing and some of the tricks we can use in the Airbus controls. So, overhead panel, control 8 takes us overhead. First thing we do is turn the batteries on. You'll hear various sounds. Let's make sure we've got the sound from the aeroplane. Yeah, you can hear the sounds as well, which is good. Uh, we'll turn the external power on because it is available, which is good. 
and we'll go and put the strobes to auto. Uh, Navin logo to two. And we're going to turn the APU on. So master switch for APU comes on and we press the start button for the APU. If we want to monitor the APU during startup, notice the screens are quite dim, we'll get to that in a moment, but we can come in here and click on APU on the Ecamm screen and it will show us its status as it starts up. So APU is, it, is the auxiliary power unit, so a small jet engine in the tail. If we go and look out the back of the aeroplane, you can see there's heat pouring out. So I'm not going to go too much into explaining the aeroplane again, I think everybody knows how the Airbus works now. So, um, back overhead, control 8, we're going to turn the cruise supply on the air supply. So emergency exit light to armed, it's down here, and a no smoking sign to auto. We'll then go and turn the ADIRS system to nav across the three systems, so this is the initial navigation system. I think I've got it set to instant alignment, otherwise we could end up sat here for 10 minutes, but to be honest today that's not going to affect us because we're going to be playing around with the MCDU in a few moments. Okay, so let's go and brighten the screens up. So the two screens here are the two knobs here, so we can brighten the left and the right screen up. On the far side, same deal, it's the two knobs. These two screens are controlled by the two knobs here. So we can go and brighten them up. And for the MCDU itself, there's a brightness flick switch there. It looks quite bright already, which is quite interesting. Usually it comes on quite dim. Anyway, um, you've also got these knobs under here which control the brightness of the displays and the, the backlighting of the buttons. Okay, so now we're going to go down to the MCDU and start programming the flight into it. So we go to the FMGC. It says we've already got GPS primary, that's because we've done instant alignment that's in the configuration in the tablet. So we'll clear that message out and we're going to go to init and we're going to go and put our route in, so YBBN to YSSY, so that's in the scratch pad, we've just keyed that in, so we then just press the soft key next to that field, and then return, and that's put the basics in. We can put a flight number in, so we'll just put 123, doesn't really matter, I don't know if this actually works, the flight number, no it doesn't, oh no it does, very good, so it is working. That didn't work for some reason last night, very strange. Cost index. So we're just going to pick a cost index. Obviously if you've got a sim brief flight plan it will tell you your cost index. Um, cruise flight level. We're going to fly at 360. It will calculate the temperature for us, which is rather handy. We can go to IRS initialization just to check that the GPSs are good, and they are. Wind temperatures. We can go and request the wind and the data flows in and it shows you all the winds aloft which will make it more accurate on the, the flight planning and estimation of fuel burn, that kind of thing. So then we can go sideways and we can fill in zero fuel weight automatically, we don't have to look it up. So you just click the soft key next to it, it puts it into the scratch pad and a second click fills it in. So we can go to fuel planning and we can confirm the block fuel. So it's saying here 2.9. So this is where it gets interesting with this version of the Airbus. Um, I'm not sure if they've done it on the tablet. Let's just have a quick look. So if we go and turn the tablet on, can we influence the fuel level? Uh, fuel. Yeah, we've got way more. Although that mm, is the 2.9 showing pounds though. So do we get to influence that in the tablet? Weight unit pounds. Let's have a look now. If we go back into here. Interesting. OK, I'm going to put it back in kilograms because Airbus is normally work on kilograms anyway. So we go back into here, put this back on kilograms. So we're going to not pay too much attention to fuel because we'll have far more than we need anyway. So control 5 brings us back over. 
So we've done the, the basic init pages. We can go to performance and we've got the V speeds here for rotate on the runway given, but they'll be dependent on a flap setting. So if we try and click them, it won't, it won't do anything. It will auto calculate them as soon as you've got a flap setting. So if we put flaps two in to do a fairly rapid takeoff, and then we should be able to click these boxes and it will pre-calculate the V-speeds for the runway. There we go. And transition altitude is 10,000 feet. I know that from the chart from Navigraph, so flown here before. <laughs> if you want to see where that is on the chart, if you pull up the, um, sorry, the standard instrument departure chart, there we go, look, transition altitude 10,000. So this will help the um, uh, the managed uh, climb mode on the aircraft to you know introduce the restrictions for speeds. And then we go next phase. And we can see that it's good for the climb. And there's the cruise. We can leave all this default. And there's the descent. And then we've got approach to the the other end we can fill this in on the way but we can fill some of it in there anyway so Q and H at the other end let's go and have a look so we can either do this in Navigraph or little nav map if I show you one little nav map that's probably a nice way to do it so we've got Kingford Smith here on the information screen in little nav map just by double clicking on it and we can go to weather and we can see we've got the, the Q and H there 1011 hectopascals so back inside the aeroplane we can put in 1011 temperature at the destination was 23 centigrade so put it in the scratch pad and drop it into temperature the wind at the destination so we've got 47 degrees 4 knots so 0 0.47 slash 0 0.4 and transition altitude was 10,000 feet again. And we've noticed we've also got Barrow over here, so we know that runway 07 is a Cat 1, so it wants a Barrow, which is the decision altitude. So looking on the chart over here for the ILS, you can see decision is 220. Okay, so we can go next phase, and that's all good. We can so that's all done, <coughs> but we haven't done the routing. If we go and look at the flight plan, all we've got is going from Brisbane to Sydney. So if we go and select Brisbane, and we're going to say we're going to depart on runway. And then what did I say? Let's have a look at our text description again. Zero one right, and do the Saneg one standard instrument departure so zero one right and we can't see it yet so we'll push the through and Sanic one okay and we'll insert that into our plan notice when it comes back to the flight plan page if we scroll up and down the bottom line stays in place so your destination airfield is always visible there so if we go and select that one we can then choose the arrival information and again you could change this while you're in flight so we're going to come in ILS 07 and we're going to go and do the Bore 3A standard terminal arrival route. So then there's nothing else to choose, we insert that and that's put that into our route. So if we scroll down you can see we've got everything in there about arriving and departing but we've got no airways in there yet. So if you remember We've got the Saneg 1 look is coming through here with the waypoints. There's Saneg, there's top of climb, there's top of descent, and there's the beginning of the star. So what we want to do after Saneg is put in some more. So we select Saneg and we can put in what the next waypoint is or airways. Yeah? So we can go to airways. So airways from Saneg. Okay, so we want to do, let's have a look at our route description from Saneg, H91 to Igdam. So H91, put that in the via, 
to Igdam. And then next, we want to do H652 to Bori. Takes a moment sometimes. There we go. B O R E E. And we can insert that into our flight plan. Okay, so you can now see if you scroll through the flight plan, we get to Saneg, then we go to Hugo, Agap uh, sorry, Apagi, Tessie, Admar, Sanad, Mesim, Igdam. Okay, so it's put in. If we're going to have a quick look at this, it's put in all of these interstitial waypoints, I guess you would call them, along the way. So Apaki, Tessi, Admar, Sanad, Mesim, and then Igdam. Okay, and it will have done the same the other side as well. So if we go and look past Igdam, we've got Sadlo, Bori, Bori. Notice you've got Bori twice. That's because that's the end of the route, and then you've got the beginning of the star. So we could clear that up a little bit, just get rid of that one. And we've got a discontinuity there now, which we clear out. So if we continue scrolling down, you will see we've got a discontinuity. That's where we go manual after ovals. Remember we saw that on the map? So we leave that in, we don't clean it up. So this is going to come into showing you the first little trick we're going to build into this. Is we're going to put a, a line on the navigation display. So if we just pull this round and put this onto plan mode on the navigation display and we'll sh come out to 20 mile range at least so there we are at ovils which is where we are at the moment so that when it's in plan mode this will show the second line down in the flight plan page okay and you can obviously you can scroll backwards and forwards by moving this display you can see this is moving the what's centered on the on the display so if we zoom out a bit further there we go so you can see there's actually no routing there we actually want to fly from ovils over to ANCUP so but rather than put a line in that the airplane will just blindly follow what would be nice is how can we draw a line on the navigation display so what we do is we press flight plan to come back up to the top obviously we're going to lose sight of it here which is fine and we click the right soft key next to the first line in the flight plan display. Let's press control five to see that. So I looked at the flight plan. If you just press flight plan, it goes to the top. Next to the top line, press the rightmost soft key. And, and it's not making much sense. <laughs> it should be showing fixes. Oh, it's the left one, sorry. Brain fade, completely that's a brain fade. So yes, on the flight plan page, you go and click the leftmost soft key on the first line. It won't do it on other ones, so you see fixed info is there. If we try that on another one, on another line, it won't be there. So on the first, on the top line of the, um, the flight plan, we can get a fixed info. And in a fixed info, we can put in whatever we want. So if we go and look at the map here, we want a line from Ovils. O V I L S. Drop that into the fix. And now we can either put a radial in, so a straight line, or a radius. So if we go and have a look at the little nav map, because this actually makes it a little bit clearer for us what we want to do, we want a line at 192 degrees from Ovils which should then hit ANCUB. So if I put in 192 and drop that into the radial, then let's have a look at that. So if we then come back to the flight plan page, so we're looking at the navigation display here, and we skip down through our route, you will now see we've got a blue dotted line from Ovils at the angle we requested that just extends out infinitely. But it will give us a good visual reference during takeoff. 
Another thing we might want to do is draw a, say, a hundred nautical mile circle around Sydney on the map, so we can just got a nice visual reference while we're flying of when we're getting close to Sydney. So what do we do? We go to flight plan, click the leftmost button, go to fix info, and notice this is fix info one of four, so we can go sideways and we can make a different one. So we'll actually use the airport as our point of the airport as our point of reference. So YSSY is the ICAO code for Sydney. So we'll drop that in, and we'll do a radius of 100 nautical miles. And if we go and look at the map now, if we go and zoom this all the way out, and go to flight plan, and skip down the flight plan with the up arrow. There's our circle around Sydney. Okay, the other thing we're going to do, just for a bit of fun along the way, if we go and look at our route on Little Nav Map, I'll show you how to do this in um, Navigraph as well. Navigraph's a bit more manual. Well, they, they both are, to be honest. So, halfway along here, we'll go from Apagi, perhaps, to Tessie. So it's only a 40 mile leg anyway, but what if we, from a Paggy, wanted to go uh, to a particular point over here for whatever reason? So maybe it was 240 degrees for 26 miles to this point over here. So we could, in Little Nav Map, we can do this just by right clicking and adding that position to the flight plan, and it does that. Okay? So if you did this in Navigraph, we got a Paggy and Tessie. So what was the 240 degrees, 26 miles? So what you can do is just hold the left mouse button down in the middle of a leg and then drag it until it's vaguely similar. So there's the same routing, okay? And it's put a custom waypoint in. We can do the same in the aeroplane. So if we come down and we'll just scroll this around until we get to it. So there's a Paggy. So if we select a Paggy, what we need to do is put a next waypoint in, but we want to do a custom one. So what we can do is say, from a Paggy, so let's press Control 5 so you can see this. From a Paggy, we want to go at 240 degrees for 26 nautical miles. So a Paggy slash 240 slash 26. And put that in as the next waypoint after a Paggy. So if you scroll down now, we've now got this PBD01 has appeared. And that is that custom waypoint. So can you see it? And it's put it in at the moment. We haven't actually inserted it into the flight plan, so we see it as a dotted line. If we then insert that, watch that, it's now made it part of the route. So I just thought that was a fascinating one to show people. It's kind of one of the lesser known things you can do about introducing custom waypoints into your routing. And you know, you can do that just by inserting them on top of other waypoints as you normally might, but the nice way to do it is to select an existing waypoint and then put it in as a next waypoint on the detail screen that pops up. Okay, so we've basically done the route now. So let's go and work our way further through the um, configuration of the aeroplane. So we're going to be using managed mode for the climb out. So the way the FGCP works, or the master control panel for the autopilot in the Airbus, you've got managed mode, which is where a dot appears on the status display along here, and you've got selected mode. So if you, if you click the top half of the knobs, they push in, so you're pushing the knob towards the aeroplane, means the aeroplane makes a decision based on the flight plan. If you pull the knob towards yourself, that's selected mode, it means you, you get to make the decision. So you're pulling the knob towards the pilot, the pilot's doing it. So we're going to go manage mode. So manage mode for the speed, manage mode, man, manage mode, manage mode for the heading. And then we go and key in our, or dial in our initial altitude. We'll select 10,000 feet as a first step for climb out and push that towards the airplane so we get a dot, so the plane will do it all on its own. 
we set, need to go and set the barometric pressures. So we can either look that up on the chart, so get the Metar readout, or we can press B. So 2983, a nice trick in the fly-by-wire Airbus to get the barometric pressures for the departure and destination airfields. If you go to the MCDU menu button, then go to ATSU, and then the AOC menu, you can do a WX or a weather request. So it's pre-programmed in with the airfields that you are flying from and to. So you just send that request. So it's sent. And then on the display here in a moment, it will say there's a company message. So you just give it a few moments. And while we're waiting for that, we will just hang on. That company message has just popped up, look. So if we come back in here, return to the AOC menu, and go to the received messages. We've got METAR has come in, so we can either read it on the screen, so we can see 350 degrees, 7 knots, and so on and so forth, and we've got Q QNH1010, which is the important bit for us. We can print that out though. If we click the print button, and it comes out this little thermal printer, which I think is a fantastic trick. And once that's done, we can tear that off. So wait for it to finish printing, tear it off, and it sticks it in front of the quadrant. Okay, so now we've got that to refer to. So 1010 is the bit we were actually after. So we can switch this over to hectopascals. It's already at 1010 because we pressed B. Okay, so that does actually reflect the altitude we're at at the moment, which is the important thing. So, back overhead, control 8. We're going to go and turn the seatbelt sign on now and get on with the rest of getting the aeroplane ready. So, electric section in the middle, external power can come off because obviously the APU's up and running now. And we can do the pushback. So, I think the fly-by-wire has some clever pushback toys. So, if we go and look in the ground section and go to pushback, we can say use the pushback system so we can confirm it it says it can can, can cause problems i've got nothing else installed though so we can call the tug so we just wait for the tug so i'm just trying to remember the layout of the airfield let's go and have a quick look at brisbane we can do this in little nav map just by zooming in on the airfield so we want to effect effectively turn back to the right so we just wait for the tug I think it usually skips a little bit when it gets aligned there it goes so we're connected I've released the parking brake and now we can use the buttons here to control our pushback and we want to go right, but we'll hang on a moment. So while that's happening, typically, the tug will give permission to start the engines. So to do that, we'll put the APU bleed on. We'll turn the ignition to start, and we'll start the right engine. Oh, we haven't done the fuel pumps, so before that gets too far, we'll go and turn the fuel pumps on. deviating from the checklist which is always a, a mistake so we're cle clear of the ground vehicles so we can now start this turning right so the engine will come up when it stabilizes I think it's when the box lighting goes out it means you can use the the other starter. Somebody will probably correct me on that. Okay. Start engine number one. So it always seems a bit busy doing this in the simulator because there's only one of you doing it. Whereas obviously in the real world that wouldn't happen. So let's put ourselves back on arc mode over here. Reduce the range down. See what else we haven't done. So we haven't set the PWS. That's good. 
nose wheel steering disconnected that's interesting that shouldn't have happened again it's probably something I've missed somewhere so we can probably stop the pushback at this point so let's come in here and say yep we can stop pushing us now we'll put our parking brake back on we'll disconnect the tug and turn the system off so we'll see him pull away from the aeroplane so we've got engines up and running now so we need flaps to take off position so we want two so I've just used my, used my quadrant to do that but it's moved this lever basically we need to arm the ground spoilers And I'm, I'm aware that, yeah, I'm deviating. I've gone and started the engines when I put the beacon light on. So I'm just going to go and catch up on the checklist properly. Arm doors and cross -check. I should have had the beacon light on before I started the engines, and I didn't. So that's on me. So the APU leak can now come off, obviously, because the engines are running. The APU can come off as well. And um, we're ready to taxi, so we've done the flaps. I've now I've got arm nose wheel steering written on my checklist and it's, uh, it's already done it now so that's good I'm just trying to listen to the um, the cabin message there uh, we can release the parking brake we need the taxi light on to nose wheel so there we go release the parking brake and should we put head tracking on now? Uh, and give it a tiny amount of positive thrust and it will start rolling. Now the Airbus has an amount of positive thrust at idle. So we're going to taxi our way out now. We'll go straight for the Alpha taxiway. chicken with the fuel truck. <laughs> I love the AI ground traffic in Flight Simulator. It has it's completely brainless, isn't it? I then I guess they didn't know which way we were going either, so Okay. So what else do we need to do? I'm just gonna turn head tracking off while I check the nose wheel steering. It's reacting okay. Okay, so we don't need to do anything else until we get to the runway, really. So when we get there, it's going to be... Uh, I've not got TCAS on my list here, actually. Let's go and set the transponder to TCAS then. So down here, we can go and put this on auto. And we can set this to TA. Flight attendants, please prepare for takeoff. It's interesting which switches trigger which audio cues in the aircraft, isn't it? So we're still on idle, and you have to be aware of that. The aeroplane is slowly accelerating. So it's worth pointing out the managed mode on the autopilot will oh we've still got the ignition switch on look so we've got the message here so a good thing to do is just double check some of this stuff so ignition can come off because obviously we've finished starting the engines gonna run another truck over we should have stickers on the side of the cabin shouldn't we with how many trucks we've run over So we're giving ourselves the full runway, we don't need it in this aeroplane. We're in the we're not on Alpha, are we? We're on the Bravo taxiway. Again, if you were taking instruction from ground, they would soon notice if you were on the wrong taxiway. So I've obviously taxied without taking any notice of the the charts. Obviously if you've got Navagraph you've got no excuses and little nav map's actually very good as well. So 
just use the brakes too much. So obviously you can see, yeah, we're on the Bravo taxiway. If you zoom in, I think they get letters. There you go. So Bravo and Alpha. Nearly missed the turn while we were busy looking. You do need to be aware with the Airbus, it's perhaps modelled more accurately in the fly-by-wire than many of the others. The nose wheel steering is not immediate, so there are servos on that nose wheel that rotate it to the angle you have commanded, and they take a while to do that. So it won't react instantaneously to your control inputs. second. Okay, sorry about that. And now I'm going to go flying off the tarmac. This always happens every time I try and record anything in the daytime. Anyway, I'm not going to worry too much. I have to try and remember what we're doing now. We're just pulling out to the wrong way. Yeah, real commercial pilots don't have to suddenly go and fix the Wi-Fi for their house halfway through recording something, do they? Okay, so on the parking brake, holding short on the runway, landing lights can come on, strobe is on auto. Um, of course the laptop with the checklist has now gone into standby because I wasn't looking at it for a few minutes, so that's all cocked up as well. <laughs> Okay, so we are essentially ready to go, so off the parking brake, throttles fully forwards, so we now monitor the indicated airspeed ribbon and hold the centre line with the rudder, the aeroplane's stuck, there's a slight element of crosswind. Climb the tent before we get too fast. The autopilot can come on. Raise the flaps away. So you'll see the aeroplane is now going to follow that track. So that immediate right turn. Flaps are still retracting. Grain spoilers are still armed. They can be removed. And we're flying out towards 10,000 feet on managed mode. God, it's so funny, isn't it? If you're distracted from your train of thought of what you're doing, it really throws you. speeds weren't on the... did I actually put them in? I'm sure that I did, obviously it's not here to look at now. But, um, the V-speeds weren't on the display. Hmm. So, coming up to 5,000 feet. It's interesting for me, every time I get into a plane I haven't flown for a while and I haven't been in the A320 much over the last kind of six months or so. It's always a bit of a jarring first flight. We're trying to remember how everything works. So it's holding it at 240 knots at the moment on the managed speed mode. And we may find that that's down to the chart. So let's have a look. Have we got any... Yeah, 240 knots look. So that's the managed mode taking care of the speed restriction. And you can also see that on the flight plan page. So 240 knots to 
Yeah, it's doing a pretty good job. It's coming up to 10,000 feet. So once we get to 10,000 feet, the landing lights can come off and we switch the uh, barometric pressure as well. Okay, we have a huge tail going on here with the scenery, which is horrible, but we'll ignore that. That may be down to me having to go and pull the plug on the Wi-Fi a moment ago. For all I know, I've lost internet on this computer. Have I actually still got a signal? Yes, I have. Okay, so we're at 10,000 feet, so landing lights come off. We reset the barometric pressure to standard, so we pull it to make it standard, and it's synchronized on both sides. I think that's an option in the aircraft settings. And then we're going to go and set for our cruise altitude of 36,000 feet. And we push that towards the aeroplane, so essentially commanding it, go do this. And you can see the vertical speed is increasing. And the aircraft's just getting back onto the track. So as we climb out, you can see the speed increases going in there. It's aiming for 290 knots now. So we're on our way. So once we get to cruise, we'll switch the seatbelt sign off and then everybody can go mad with racing to the toilet or ordering sandwiches or whatever they want to get from the cabin crew. <laughs> so I'll probably get wrecked over the coals in the comments because I didn't put the auto brake on for um, takeoff, but never mind. I love that this has the printer. It's a bit of a part. It's always been a, a bit of a differentiator of this aircraft versus the others. So obviously we've, we're not using a sim brief operational flight plan, so we have nothing in here. But we can at least get the aircraft overview, which is quite cool. If you wanted to, because this is not connected to the MCDU, you can always do a sim brief after the fact. So I'll just show you how to do that. Eat some time on the departure, won't it? So if we open up browser, go to sim brief and dispatch. And do a new flight and we'll put in just some basic information. So it was YBBN to YSSY. Aircraft type is the A3, A20N. And it's given us some automatic routing, but we actually specified a route, didn't we? So we'll pop down here and throw this into the routing. And we can analyze that and it will say, yes, that's valid, which it should do anyway. We can see the altitude there. We want to go to 36,000. And we can generate the flight. So once we've done this, we can go back in the aeroplane and pull this through. Obviously, the timings won't be correct. You know, for the um, arrival and departure time, but we at least get the information back up on here. So if we go then to the operational flight plan and import the SIMBRIEF data, we then get an OFP to look at. Okay. So climbing out, coming through 20,000 feet very soon. We can, at the moment we're showing the APU on the ECAM screen. If you just click the button again, it will show you the, the default screen. No, typically during the normal checklist, you'd go and look around the, the various things. I think on the runway, it would show you the um, it would show you the the state of the brakes and the undercarriage which you can see here somewhere if I remember how wheels there we go so you get the temperatures across the the main gear which is always useful you know, flight control systems all of these work by the way it's really good
obviously we get engines on the main display up here so they don't tend to have it on the second screen as well. So TCAS is up and running, that's denoted by the, the range rings. We could increase the range on here now to see the route that's coming. So there's our deviation at Agapi, uh, sorry, Apagi. So something else that's going to be of interest during this flight is if we come down to this end and look at it, there's a couple of holds. So there's a hold at Bori. So I think it might be worth putting the hold in just to see how that works. So if we go and scroll down through our flight plan and we see there's Bori. If we select Bori, we can choose hold and we can see it's doing 159 degrees inbound course, which I think is probably correct. So 158 has gone here on the exit. So it's close to 159, yeah, it says in the middle of the hold. Uh, turning right, and we probably only want a one minute leg length, so if we put one on or revert to computed, see what it says, we can insert that anyway. And you will now see that if we scroll down again, uh, scroll up actually, there's uh, Bori, there's the hold and back into Bori, so it's going to do that hold pattern repeatedly. And we remember we've still got further down the flight plan, if we scroll the other way, we've still got that discontinuity in place, which is absolutely fine. We'll use that as an excuse to go to selected mode on the heading, just to show you how that works. Right, coming up through 28,000 feet soon, so there's not going to be much else to watch until we get to that hold really, or until we get to descent, so I'll, um, I'll let the aeroplane go on its own and I'll pause recording for a while when we're a bit further down track. Okay, see you in a minute. Okay. So we are approaching that 100 nautical mile range from the airport, but while I was looking at this, I actually noticed we've got a better place we could do a hold to have a bit more fun, to play around with some of these new, or not new, but some of the um, functions we've been looking at as part of the exploration of what we can do. So I'm going to clear out this hold that we put in at Bori. So you can see that's just vanished. Let me clear the um, discontinuity. So we've now got our route essentially going straight in without a hold programmed in anymore. So I was looking at the, the Navigraph chart for the approach and it's got a hold here, uh, and cup, okay, with a 62 degree to come into it. So what we're going to do is go and program that in instead. And we'll get rid of this discontinuity. We'll put some custom waypoints in just to show that we can do this. So ANCUB will go in, we'll put the hold in. Though the inbound course will be 62 degrees because we're going to vector ourselves into this. So let's press control five so we can see this. And it's going to be a left turn. So we type L. Or we do if we click on it correctly. Okay, the airplane just had a bit of a fit on this. Go left, 62 degrees, and we've got a one minute, there we go. So that's good, one minute, left turn, 62 degrees, and we can insert that, okay. So if we scroll down, we can see there's our discontinuity f leaving Ovils. Okay, so what we're going to do for the moment is clear out this discontinuity and clear out the manual as well clear that discontinuity so at this moment it's going to try and go straight from ovals to NCUB but we're going to use this ability to be able to put extra waypoints in so from ovals we're going to use little nav map to figure this out because it's got this lovely drawing tool so we're going to go 244 degrees for 16 miles from ovals out to this corner so we want ovals Shash 244 
slash 16. So at, from Ovils for 244 degrees for 16 miles. So after Ovils it goes to there. Okay. So then if we scroll down we can see we've got Ovils and then we've got PBD02 which is our custom waypoint. So then also from PBD02 which is essentially, well, let me get the, the right screen up, we want to go from that one that we've just invented for 157 degrees for 15 miles. Or thereabouts. I've got the tab order wrong there. 150, let me just double check that. So for 157 for 15 miles. So from this invented waypoint, we can do it again. So from PBD02, PBD02, we can go 157 for 15. And put that in as the next waypoint. So if we go and look through, we can see we've got PBD02 and then 03 then. So let's go and have a look at that just to make sure and see what we've drawn. See, so you can see that marked in there now. Obviously it's basing the ra radiuses, I think, on the speeds we're doing, so they're wrong. But if we insert that, we can see it there, look. So we've put this box shape in. So hopefully that makes sense to you. If we zoom in a bit on this and step through the legs, so if we put this back on plan mode and then step back through the legs, uh, wrong way, <laughs> and zoom in a bit further, yeah so as we leave Ovils we've got our two custom waypoints and the reason for coming out further in this manner was to bring us into this hold in the right direction. Yeah. Oops. So we can see where we can see it on the chart here in Navigraph. Where ent our entrance angle should be 62 degrees into the hold, and then it will fly the left racetrack at 3,000 feet. So we need to be at 3,000 feet. But before we even get anywhere near that, we need to look at the, the rest of this route in. So if we look at the, the Borry, you can see, although Borry is marked at the top of the plate, it's actually out of scale. It says not to scale here because Borry is actually over here. So Vasra at 8,000 feet. So Vasra's here, look. So above 8,000, below 9,000 for Barrow. Some, some pretty strange limitations but we'll let the aeroplane take care of doing that for us on the way in. So our real aim is to get to 3,000 feet by the time we do this square pattern back into NCUB. And this is one of the things that actually Navigraph's terrible at. You can't... I'll show you what happens. If I try and do this to replicate kind of what we've done which is that, if I let go it goes wrong. It can't insert waypoints between the approach and the arrival. Yeah, so it goes and makes this bizarre extra waypoint now. So if we go and click on that, and we'll remove it from the flight plan, so it's LIHR it's going to put in, which we didn't want. So in some respects, little nav map is better in that way. It's interesting that we, although we did sequential waypoints there, we could have just done another one from Ovils and given it the the vector from Ovils to this corner but we did it because I thought it was more interesting to actually make up a custom waypoint and then make up another one from the custom waypoint which is what we've got here so we've got PBD02 and then PBD03 anyway let's go and put this back on arc mode we should be getting fairly close to yeah, we're 20 miles away from descent, so what we'll do is go and set ourselves to, 
to come down to 10,000 feet initially just because that's the transition altitude so it gives us a nice marker so we'll if we tell the airplane to do that it will actually start descending immediately but it will only do it I think at a thousand feet a minute because it's taking it as basically an altitude change en route it's not actually the descent although we might be close enough for it to do it no it's going to go for a thousand feet a minute but you will see as soon as we get to the actual descent point which I think is just past Sadlow it will start actually descending, you know, properly. Put the flight deck, ladies and gentlemen. As you may have noticed, we have begun our initial descent down to our destination. Now would be a good time to wrap up any business you need to take care of as we prepare for our approach. If you are up, once you return to your seat, we ask that you remain seated until the aircraft arrives safely at the gate. Flight attendants, please prepare the cabin for arrival. Okay, so we'll give the passengers a few minutes and then we'll go and turn on the seatbelt sign. So we're just coming down a thousand feet a minute at the moment. Be worth double checking the weather on the way in. So we'll go for the information for Sydney and open the airport here, go to weather and we can see QNH is 1012. The way you can do that in little nav map, um, you can either click on the, or double click on the airport and it will pull up the information here. And obviously you've got the, the weather here. So we've got in here the pressure, which is QNH 1012, 2988 inches. So both programs do broadly the same thing. You can see here's our aeroplane approaching IGDAM. See that on the navigation display in the aeroplane. You can also see that happening in Navigraph. Here it comes. So we've removed those holds that we were looking at, maybe playing with. So we're just going to put that hold in now, or we've put the hold in on the way into the approach. So you can see it's not on the Bory 3A chart because Bory 3A only takes you as far as Ovils. So on the actual ILS chart it illustrates it it's interesting actually the runway 25 chart which is obviously the reciprocal has got more information than the runway 07 chart about the different approaches about you know um, the requirements for each approach let's have a look at Bori just briefly oh no here we go got the information here so for 07 so it's got that information about the altitudes to come through at so it says expect radar vectors to final so we are essentially by programming into the aeroplane are simulating radar vectors so we're on managed speed mode managed heading mode and manage altitude mode to get down to 10,000 feet. So when we come past this marker at Sadlow, it'd be fascinating to watch what the aeroplane does. It's about 10 miles out from the marker. Now I'm off the top of my head, I'm not completely familiar with what all of the different symbols mean. But no doubt you can find them online with you know the, the various symbology symbols for the Airbus flight plans. I always find it fascinating, there's little bits of symbology in here that it's, it's not immediately obvious what they are. So if you look, you've got ground speed 439, you've got true airspeed 460, you've got indicated airspeed 280, because obviously we're at 30 odd thousand feet. 
So the indicated airspeed is actually far less than our speed over the ground because the air pressure is so low. So here comes the marker look for descent. This is what I was waiting for. So as it comes through, watch, look at, look at this. So at this point we are going to go and turn the seatbelt sign on. So we are now steeply descending. But look, the aeroplane, be worth watching the engines. It's accelerating. Now is it going to overdo it? Or is it going to g gain control of itself? <laughs> So there's the target airspeed, but it's creeping higher. So it's bringing the engines down. It just took a while for it to happen. So we're now 15 knots faster than the target airspeed. It's now lifting the nose to counter that. So the flight director is asking the autopilot to lift the nose. and now it's stabilised. It's fascinating, isn't it, to watch it happen? To kind of figure out how its logic works. I think a lot of my fascination with the flight simulator isn't so much with the absolutely correct procedures that a pilot, you know, a real world pilot would be interested in. It's more about how does the aeroplane make these decisions? What are the triggers that cause it to, to do one thing or another? And I guess that's the laws in the Airbus. You've got normal law, this is usually an effect where is you know what it's going to do to counter a given situation that's the stuff that fascinates me so if we increase the range on this we'll see there's our plan that we've built in And we can see there's that hold entry. So as we get closer, that will get drawn in with a loop. I think on the Airbus, if we go and have a look at that briefly, so we've got this hold. If you go and select it to have a look at it, notice it hasn't got a speed associated with it. The reason for that, as far as I'm aware, is if you're in managed speed mode, the aircraft will fly the hold at the minimum speed of the to suit the configuration of the aircraft at the time. So I think on the chart, if we go and have a look at ILS, so it's got maximum 185 knots. I think that's pretty much the speed that the Airbus will fly at without flaps. And that's probably by design that an Airbus will fly at 185 knots without flaps. We'll, we'll find out when we get closer. No doubt a real pilot that knows the um, aeroplane inside out will be able to tell us the true answers for all of these questions. I'm just um, surmising, I think the word might be. So engines are idle, look, it's just ascending down. And you have this, this dot appears on the altitude, so this is its target where it thinks it should be. If you're above or below that, you know. I'm not sure if the, the, the connection warning lost is appearing on the... Um... It's appearing on the recording, but yeah, we've got our internet back apparently, or we, hopefully we will. Let me just check. Have I actually got internet? Apparently I have. As you saw earlier, we have had a couple of issues this morning. So let's reduce the range on this. we've got our it's interesting isn't it how it's even calculated the the radius turns at each waypoint along the way as well we can obviously assist the aeroplane by using spoilers to help it but we haven't needed to yet So remember when we get to 10,000 feet, the landing lights have to come on, the barometric pressure has to be set to the local airfield, 
going to a destination airfield which will be 1012. If we change the range over on the co-pilot's navigation display. Something else to double check while we're just descending in is go and have a look at this. So we've got uh, 109.9, 62 degrees for the ILS at Sydney. Um, if we go and have a look in the aeroplane, let's go and have a look at the radio page. So 109.9, 62 degrees, three degree, glide, three degree glide slope looks good, doesn't it? So come back out of there. I think one of the only things that seems to be missing from the fly-by-wire is when you do program these waypoints you can't specify I don't think whether you fly over the waypoint I think it just rounds off the corners automatically I think in the real aircraft you can specify whether it goes over the waypoint or not Okay, so we should have enough time here to decelerate as well. So we've got to get down to 250 knots below 10,000 feet as well. So we'll see how the aircraft manages doing that. So we're still at 300 knots at the moment. Look, it is starting to, it's lifting the nose gently. You can see the flight director now and again. It's reducing that rate of descent to 1,000 feet a minute now, which gives it that leeway to slow down. But as we come down below 10,000 feet, it will drop to 250 knots on the target airspeed. See that's starting to move. Here comes our 10,000 feet target. And again, that was just an arbitrary number that I put in to give ourselves a reminder. So we'll go put the landing lights on now to come down below 10,000 feet. We'll also go and push this and set it to 1012 for the QNH. And we'll now drop down to 8,000 feet. We'll go managed mode. So the target airspeed now has dropped to 250 knots to go below 10,000 feet. We can help the aeroplane do that. So I've extended the spoilers. So the aeroplane's having to obviously try to descend and decelerate. the range on the navigation display so after making this turn this is all radar vectoring essentially at this point this would be in the real world this would be ATC giving us target altitudes and ranges to fly so it's going to decelerate again when we get to this corner and we're also going to ask it to get to 3,000 feet So keep an eye on the target airspeed as we come through this marker. There it goes. Oh, it stayed at 250, that's interesting. We've asked it now to descend for 3000, which we're hoping to get to on the way into the hold. So our 
remove the spoilers and let's just see what it does without the spoilers. Do we get a green banana on the navigation display? I'm not sure that we do. It's interesting, if you put this onto VOR mode, you only get the, the radio information shown. Obviously in ARC mode you get to see the, the navigation plot, which is useful to us. So we've done all of this without enjoying any of the scenery, so we're approaching Sydney over there. You can see the city in the background. So yeah, we can see the deceleration marker is here, look. So it won't start slowing down until it gets near that hold. And so remember we want to be 185 knots on the way into the hold. So then we'll start worrying about, you know, dropping the flaps and getting the gear ready. But we won't need the gear until we come out of the hold. Let's have a look from outside. This is the first of our custom waypoints. It's very cool, isn't it, with having the managed mode sorting it all out for us. Obviously there's limits to what it can do, and I think that's where the real knowledge of the, the um, trained air Airbus crews, they know the limits. You know, they know the logic that it that it's working on. They know the various laws based on the aircraft configuration or condition. So we're just turning at 5,000. We need to drop another couple of thousand feet before we enter the hold at Ancup. We've programmed in already the. Um, the decision height into the barrow setting. When we initially programmed the flight up, so that's all good. So you can see the flight director commanding the removing the bank. I'm watching this descent marker now to see what happens to see if we'll need to help it slow down. Although it's going to make a turn which will help scrub some speed off as well. I'm only doing the hold to be honest, just for, you know, for interest's sake. There are some high points around on the approach, so you can see over here there's an 870 foot peak. So should we overlay this so we can see where we are in relation to it? So we're just coming around here so we can see this this kind of raised area. There's a hill here, I, th I guess. So coming in towards Ancub, coming down towards 3,000 feet slowly. We're still doing 250 knots, but we're about to hit the deceleration marker. So if we look on the flight plan, we'll see what it's going to do. It's going to take us down to 189. Interesting, look, it's going to command 131. So it looks like it's going to try and go for approach speed. So what it might do... Yeah, you can see there's another marker there. 
but it thinks it's going to start descending immediately. So what we'll do, we'll stay at 3,000 feet. So rather than using managed mode, we're going to do selected mode, 3,000 feet. And we're going to command 185, otherwise it might get confused. So we've gone to selected mode for 3,000 feet and 185 knots which was, will be the correct speed to come into the hold at. So you can see the speed is slowly bleeding off because we're obviously we're level. If we wanted to help it, we could just hit the spoilers. So spoilers are extended. No, notice they're not actually doing it wonderfully quickly. So 185 is just above the minimum speed for the configuration. It's looking good. And now it's drawn the hold in, look. So we'll pull this down to 10 mile range. So I've basically gone selected mode. So the aeroplane didn't think it was about to land because it's not, it's going to go into this hold. And then we'll let it think it can land. <laughs> so ANCUB 3000 feet. Okay, and then we follow the ILS. So we'll fly a circuit of the hold, just so you get to see that happening. Notice when we were banked over, the lowest speed encroached on our speed. So you need to be aware of that during the hold, to be honest. So I'm going to put the flaps out to the first stage which will allow our lower speed to be slower. So we won't be at risk. Say if the wind changed direction, it could put you into an, a potential stall. So we've got flaps in first position now. So the aeroplane is flying along 3,000 feet into this hold. It's a very low hold, isn't it? That's kind of half the reason I did it though, because it's interesting. <laughs> See, here we go, the aeroplane will bank left anytime soon. So we're at the right speed and the right altitude for entering entrance into the hold, and here it goes. So when you are in the hold, you will see there's an exit button appears on the right hand side. So that I think, I'm not going to attempt fate by doing this wrong, I think that means it will come out after, you know, after completing the hold. Whereas if you do a direct to, the aeroplane will obviously take the, the most immediate route to the waypoint you do the, the direct to and will drop the hold that way. But I'm going to wait rather than temp fate until we're on the downwind leg back in towards NCUB. But yeah, as I said earlier, the thing that fascinates me is how all these systems interoperate with each other. And what triggers what, what behaves in what manner. <laughs> how you cause the aeroplane to do what you want to do. And yeah, it's just um, fascinating. Endlessly fascinating. <laughs> So it says here, look, set hold speed. In other words, set the speed, which we have done. I think without it, it, would, it wouldn't have made any difference. I think the Airbus by default will fly the lowest speed without flaps on our hold. I'm not sure if it will 
if it will react to the flaps going down and slow you down even further. It's something to go and have a play with, I guess. So here we go, we're turning back round towards our direction. So if we say exit, as soon as we're pointing the right way, and then once we've done that, we can start configuring for landing. So we'll switch over to show the landing system on the rows. Yeah, the only shame with this, although this is nice that we have two screens here, look, so if we just reduce the range, we can see that screen over there and this one here. So we can see the positioning relative to the glide slope. So we are below the glide slope. Here comes the center line. So if we say exit, it's actually going to leave the hold. We are approaching the glide slope now as well though, look. So we're going to say we want to go to approach mode. So we can also go and get the gear down. Oh, actually I've got a switch here. I keep forgetting I've got, quad I've got the Airbus Quadra, so I've got all the appropriate switches. <laughs> so here comes the glide slope. So we can go managed speed mode now. And let the aeroplane slow itself down on the way in. So we go for the next stage of flaps. It's got Cat 3 single. This is interesting because it said Cat 1 on Little Nav Map. So does that mean then we can do this? Yes, we can get Auto Land. <laughs> Not that we'll use it, we'll probably disable everything and come in. So if the airfield has Cat 3, typically you can switch both autopilots on and it will pick up and fly you straight in. So you can see we've left the hold behind now. You can see the runway coming. 10 miles out. So let's... There's the runway directly in front of us. just manoeuvred there quite a lot didn't it so rather than let the plane have all the fun should we go and turn the autopilot and the auto throttle off so I've turned everything off Let's give the wings a waggle. And let's pull the nose up a little bit. I was just dropping below the glide slope there. So the plane would have landed itself, you know, completely automatically and taken all the fun out of it for us, but we want to actually remember how to fly these things, don't we? So gone a little bit high, we're accelerating, so we're just pulling the throttle back. To go too fast. We want to be about 135 knots ideally. Well, it's, it's targeting 120. Look, so it's um, it's quite happy going very slowly. So I'm now idle on the throttle, and that's holding us at that speed. So I'm going to extend the spoilers a little bit just to scrub some of that speed back off. just watching the landing system or the you know the CDI and the glide slope marker there just to keep ourselves broadly on them but that One tiny point. amount of positive thrust that you get in the Airbus is keeping us 
just above 120 knots pretty much on its own on the three degree glide slip. If we have to hit any throttle at all it will accelerate us. So I'm just edging it forwards now. low so we can see the happy lights now I'm more inclined to follow the happy lights than the ILS usually because the simulator quite often too low so we're getting, terrain yeah we're getting low look so too we're like a little terrain. bit below too the glide slope terrain. so I'm just gently pulling us back up to too it low terrain too low terrain and that's got us back onto the pappies. Too low terrain that's interesting look. Terrain. It's still saying that even though too low terrain. Too low terrain. We could do this as well, could we? Low, Go terrain. landing system, we get the notifications too here as well. Low, terrain. So even though we're high too now, low, it's terrain. still saying too low. Too low terrain. That's funny. So if we cut too low, kill that. Terrain. Too low terrain. Too so low, even terrain. though we're still too high too according low, to the Pappies and the ILS. Too low terrain. Too low terrain. Too low terrain. Too low terrain. <laughs> That's annoying. Too isn't low it? terrain. Too low terrain. Too low okay, terrain. Okay, so we just glide it in this last little bit. Too low terrain. Too low terrain. Twenty. Ten. Five. A little bit heavy. To be honest, I was more worried about the um more worried about the airspeed there, it started to drip, drift a little bit low, so we've gone reverse, come off the reverses, flaps up, spoilers up, wheel brakes, and we'll continue on to the taxiway. Let's put the head tracking on so we can see where we're going. Let's exit the runway. It's not my best landing ever. Oh, look at that, the... Um, Air brakes have kicked in. Sorry, the wheel brakes have kicked in. I didn't have the auto brakes on, but even so, it still stopped itself dead. You expect that amount of positive thrust to kick in? Put the nose wheel taxi light back on. If I can get the mouse onto it, there we go. And we'll go and find somewhere to park. So, yeah, as I said earlier, the real fascination for me is seeing how all those different systems interact with each other, more so than doing things absolutely correctly. Because obviously we had no air traffic controllers watching, we weren't being scored. Yeah, that's interesting. I came off the, the brake some time ago and it still kept braking. parking brake on. Now the interesting thing now, we have got external power available so we can say please yes plug it in and that would allow us to immediately switch the engines off. Obviously this is all cleared with ground usually when you're doing this sort of stuff. So the crossover happens to using the external power and then you can busy yourself with Doing things like turning the fuel pumps back off. The doors verified. Turning the inertial navigation system off. Turning the crew supply back off. Turning the lights off. Oops, wrong way. And then you could play games, I think, in the fly-by wire with connecting things to the aircraft. So you could say, we would like the jet bridge please, and out it comes, and if we open the uh -huh. the forward door, I think that's the correct one, if we come around the corner, do we have to unlock this door, does it actually work in this aircraft, maybe it doesn't.
Can we go straight through it? No. Yeah, I'm not sure if it had the interior modelled. But anyway, there we go. And you can see it fits really nicely on the fly-by-wire. Yeah, I don't think it's got... You know, there's no interior modelling look. It's got that crafty 3D trick going on inside. Anyway. You get some idea how that works. Very cool. Okay, so obviously inside you can go and power everything down and go through everything, turn the batteries off. But I'm not going to go through the full procedure. But I hope you enjoyed that. We looked at quite a lot there around the different functionalities inside the MCDU and looked at little nav map and navigraph along the way. So hopefully you found that interesting. Now there's obviously tons and tons to learn about all these aeroplanes and there's always something new to be playing around with. So anyway, I'm going to leave it there. Hopefully you enjoyed that, and I'll see you again soon.